He produces a popular podcast on Orthodox liturgy and life in active the kingdom, along with his former student, Father Yubi Eladio. He is involved in dialogue between Orthodox Christians and Jews under the auspices of the International Council of Christians and Jews and also represents the Orthodox Church in the United States of the Canadian Council of Churches Commission for Faith and Witness. And now please join me in inviting Father Jeffrey to stage to give his greeting remarks. Thank you. Exit the church at the back up the steps, and if you follow yourself, follow out the doors and find your way to the basement, there are both gentlemen and ladies washrooms there. Your holiness, distinguished guests, brothers and sisters in Christ, it is an honor and a privilege to welcome you here this evening to Trinity College, part of the University of Toronto. Trinity College is a renowned institution. It's a venerable institution. It had its origins in 1841, 182 years ago, which is a long history indeed uh, amidst settler institutions in this country. It received its charter to grant degrees in 1851 from Queen Victoria, and originally its location was to the west of the campus here, a uh, place today known as Trinity Bellwoods Park, and the Trinity part of that owes its name to Trinity College having its origin there. All you find left now are the original gates of the school, which are the gates to enter the park. Uh, the college relocated itself in the early 20th century when it affiliated, amalgamated with the University of Toronto, has been on this location since, but the chapel that you're in was the last part of the complex to be built in the 1950s. But a fun fact is that the architect of this chapel, Sir Giles Gilbert Scott, also designed the famous red British phone box that you probably would recognize, as well as Liverpool Cathedral and Battersea Power Station, which is today a leisure facility and shopping mall on the South Bay Bank of the Thames, most noted because it appeared on the cover of the 1977 Pink Floyd album, Animals. So there you go. There's a connection between Pink Floyd and where you're sitting. <laughs> but the more venerable thing about Trinity College isn't this long and storied history. It isn't about all the people who graduated from this institution and gone on to careers in politics or law or medicine. It is its history of involvement in ecumenism. Uh, to name just a few figures from the 20th century who are noted in worldwide global ecumenism within the Christian world, I would think of someone like uh, Bishop Charles Brent, who was instrumental in organizing the 1927 Faith and Order Conference in Lausanne, which was a precursor to the eventual formation of the World Council of Churches. So a graduate of Trinity College was responsible for the Faith and Order Commission. Later, people that, that served on that included uh, people like Professor Eugene Fairman, who taught here for many years, and was a dean uh, of the College of the Faculty of Divinity here, and influenced so many people. He was an observer at the Second Vatican Council. He was one of the forming members of the Anglican Catholic and Anglican Orthodox dialogues. And then under people like Father Fairweather, we have graduated from this place many participants in the worldwide dialogues, particularly the Anglican Roman Catholic and Anglican Orthodox dialogues. With us this evening is Canon Allison Barnett Cowan, who was the director of the Anglican Communion's Office of Unity, Faith, and Order for many years. And coordinated many of those dialogues, including the renewed Anglican Oriental Orthodox dialogue that culminated in the statement that had been first hashed 
out in Etchumyatsin, and then finalized in Cairo in 2014, where there was an agreement, an agreed statement on Christology. Um, but the person I want to most single out is a bishop named Henry Hill. Um, Henry Hill was the bishop for some short time of Ontario. Now you might think that's the whole province, but in Anglican speak, that means just the small diocese to the east of Toronto, centered around Kingston. Uh, he was bishop there from 1975 to 1981, but he resigned that post for one reason. He wanted to go on pilgrimage to all the churches in the east. And over many years, accompanied by other alumni and ecumenical leaders from this college, like John, John Gibault, who succeeded Alice in Wonder Calvary at post that I spoke of, he went and he spoke to and visited Christians throughout the, the, the eastern part of the Mediterranean, especially focusing on the Oriental Orthodox Church churches and the Assyrian Church of the East. And he rejoiced in those visits. He was the, the person who really opened up those churches to the West at a time when they were little known. He went and he found that by praying and working with Christians, uh, Orthodox Christians in that part of the world, it was already a unity of faith, a unity of prayer, a unity of life that could be built upon. And he came back and famously there was a book produced kind of here called Light from the East, which many of you may have seen. It's still a real treasure trove of, uh, of insight into the Oriental and uh, Assyrian Church of, of the East. And Henry Hill was, by his very example, a model to so many people. And I like to think, although this has probably never been said in public before, he is instrumental in the fact that today, here at Trinity College, we have an Eastern Orthodox Christian Studies program. He didn't set it up, but the people that he influenced were instrumental in allowing this to take place. The hospitality, the grace, the generosity of an Anglican faculty of divinity to open its doors to Orthodox Christian program that unites both Eastern and Oriental Orthodox. This is really in keeping with what Bishop Charles Brent had set up by setting up that first faith order conference in 1927 in Lausanne, because those ecumenical encounters that Anglicans have been known to facilitate over the most of the last century have often been, been the only place where Orthodox have been able to talk to other Orthodox where some of the, the strange or separated churches of the East, where communion has been difficult, difficult to enact and not to, to have in theory, where ecumenical conferences and encounters became the very place where Orthodox churches could begin to talk to one another. And so today, how fitting is it that Bishop Henry Hill's legacy and the legacy of all those graduates of Trinity College have gone on to do such marvelous work on the dialogues and ecumenism throughout the world. How fitting it is that today we have such a vibrant and strong program of Orthodox Christian Studies here at Trinity College. It's part of the Toronto School of Theology, um, the seven colleges that make up what is a world-renowned institution of graduate theological studies. I welcome you all to learn more about it. We have had Armenian students, and famously in our midst, Father Vartan uh, represents them. We would encourage uh, your holiness to consider this your home as well. This is a place where Orthodox are at home, where Orthodox are given a strong and warm welcome, where we have the freedom to speak to one another, to work together with one another, and to brush up, to, to rub shoulder to shoulder with other Christians, not only the Anglicans here within the Faculty of Divinity of Trinity College, but also the other colleges that make up the consortium that is the Toronto School of Theology, Roman Catholic, United, Presbyterian, and so forth. So for all these reasons, it's really fitting that we have in our midst this evening the Holiness, who is a noted ecumenist. But before I introduce His Holiness, I would like to just read a very short section from his book, 
It is the introduction by Henry Hill, where he talks about his experience of the Oriental churches, and having visited them all, having spent so much time there, how he as an Anglican responded to those visits, to those encounters, to the, to the deep fellowship and fraternity that he felt with all those he encountered. Um, he says, directing his remarks to the Oriental Christians, you go back to the very beginning of Christianity, your homelands are the homelands of our faith and Christian culture. The founders of your churches were the apostles or their earliest disciples. We admire your constancy and witness during the long years of the Islamic and Ottoman empires. You are still there at the fountain place of our faith, but we know that there is no less pressure upon you than in former days. Your presence in the diaspora throughout the Western world gives us all much more opportunity to meet your church and to learn from you. But we also realize the persecutions and pressures which have driven your peoples out from their homelands to found new communities in a very different culture, separated from the wellsprings of your tradition. Your churches are at the interface of some of the greatest issues facing the world today. Christianity and Islam face each other, and there is an increasing stridency in the followers of the Prophet, which makes dialogue more difficult than in former years. We all salute your courageous witness. We, in spite of our, of our different inheritance in respect to the expression of the doctrine of Christ, believe, I believe that we share the same underlying faith. It is important for Christians to show that in spite of different traditions, are one. We need this in the West, with your diaspora, to confront secularism and materialism. You need unity in the East to bear your witness in the face of the politicized and religious pressures put on you. The whole world needs Christians to be united, to offer hope for the unity of a humanity divided by class and race, economics and politics, riches and poverty, religion and culture. I welcome you tonight because our Lord prayed for the unity of his disciples so that the world might believe. We must seek unity not only for the sake of the church, but for the salvation of the world. His Holiness Aram I Catholicos of Cilicia was born in 1947 in Beirut, Lebanon. He studied at the Armenian Theological Seminary in Antelius, Lebanon, and the Ecumenical Institute of Bossi, Geneva, Switzerland. He received his MDiv from the Neary School of Theology, his STM jointly from the American University of Beirut and Neary School of Theology, and his PhD from Fordham University in New York. He holds several honorary degrees. His major areas of specialization are philosophy, systematic theology, and Near Eastern Church history. He was ordained as a celibate priest in 1968 and obtained the title of Vatavet, Doctor of the Armenian Church in 1970. In 1979, after serving for one year as Lord of Tenants, he was elected Primate of the Armenian Orthodox Community in Lebanon. The next year, he received Episcopal ordination. In June 1995, His Holiness was elected Catholicos by the Electoral Assembly of the Armenian Catholicosate of Cilicia and was consecrated one week later. Called to serve as primate of the Armenian community of Lebanon during the Lebanese Civil War, His Holiness reorganized parishes and schools, restructured and reactivated church-related institutions, and renewed community leadership. As the head of the church, he reorganized and revitalized the work of the church particularly in the areas of theological formation, Christian education, publications, communications, cultural activities, youth, justice and peace, and human rights. He realized several construction projects, such as the Cilicia Museum, the Center of Archives and Manuscripts, buildings for monks and bishops, guest house and offices, a center for youth and university students, and apartments in Beirut for low-income families. He's paid pontifical visits to all dioceses of the Catholicosate in the Middle East, Europe, North, and South America, and has brought a
a new dynamism to the relationship between these worldwide dioceses and the administrative center of the church in Lebanon. He's emphasized the church's outreach through social service. He's strengthened ecumenical relations and collaboration. And in the context of international relations, he met with a number of heads of states, political and religious leaders, and representatives of international organizations. On his ecumenical engagement, which is pertinent to our evening, His Holiness was appointed in 1972 as the Catholic Saints representative for ecumenical relations and served in this position until 1995. His Holiness has played a major role in the worldwide ecumenical movement. He was a founding member of the Middle East Council of Churches, and from the beginning he has served on the Council's Executive Committee. As the delegate of his church, he's attended Nairobi, Vancouver, Canberra, Harare, Porto Alegre, assemblies of the World Council of Churches. In 1975, he was elected as a member of the Faith and Order Commission of the WCC, and in 1983, as a member of the Standing Committee. At the Vancouver Assembly in 1983, he was elected as a member of the Central Committee of the WCC. And in Canberra, in 1991, he was elected moderator of the Central Executive Committee of the WCC, the highest position of this global fellowship of churches, which comprises more than 350 churches from different confessions, cultures, nations, and regions. He is the first Orthodox and the youngest person to be elected to the position of moderator. After serving as moderator for seven years, His Holiness was unanimously re-elected at the Harare Assembly. The re-election of His Holiness, which was based on his strong leadership, firm commitment, theological knowledge, and administrative experience, was unprecedented in the history of the WCC. Catholicos Aram I is a founding member of the Oriental Orthodox Eastern Orthodox Theological Dialogue, Oriental Orthodox Reformed Theological Dialogue, and the Orthodox Evangelical Dialogue. He's played an important role in initiation of Oriental Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and Oriental Orthodox Lutheran Theological Dialogues. And he was instrumental in creating, in 1996, the Fellowship of the Three Heads, Coptic, Syrian, and Armenian, of the Oriental Orthodox Churches. Holiness is president of the Middle East Council of Churches since November 2007. And on interreligious dialogue, he's been a strong supporter of that dialogue and cooperation and has played a significant part in promoting common values, mutual understanding, and peaceful coexistence among religions. Without further ado, as the biography goes on and on. of my brief presentation, I would like to express my uh, high appreciation to the university and college authorities for inviting me to share a few perspectives related to one of the outstanding Catholic of the Armenian Orthodox Church. I would like also to express my joy to be here in the campus of university. University has always been very close to my heart, to my life, and to my reflection and ministry. I have always perceived myself as a student the profound sense of the word. I understand that today I am supposed to share with you some perspectives and my assessment of the Catholic nurses, the gracious, and this year is the 850th anniversary of his passing. This Catholic cause of the Armenian Church is really an exceptional figure, a multi-talented person and multi-facet personality. He's a musician, a theologian, 
theologian, ecumenist, philosopher, and all these uh, unrelated dimensions of uh, his life uh, have been at the center of his uh, reflection and his uh, ministry. He belongs to the 12th century. He has lived in Silesia in multi-religious and multi-Christian environments. He has been in close touch with the Syrian, Latin and Greek churches. He has produced a number of uh, hymns, melodies, statements, confessions, but uh, his main contribution to the Armenian Church has been his uh, contribution, I would say, to the liturgical life and the spirituality of the Church, and particularly to the theological self-understanding and dogmatic position of the Armenian Church. Of course, it is not possible to introduce to you all aspects and dimensions of, of his spiritual and ecumenical and theological heritage. But I would just like to identify a number of uh, aspects which I believe are of particular importance of, of understanding uh, this great personality of the world Christopher. I will try to divide my presentation into four sections. First is theology, second is ecclesiology, third is perception of Christian unity, and then the impact of uh, his great uh, personality on the theological thinking uh, of the Armenian Church, and even beyond the Armenian Church, his impact on the ecumenical movement. First, theology. For narcissistic races, theology is not reflection about God. It is dialogue, conversation with God. His whole theology is based on these uh, human being and God relationship and dialogue. This is the theology of Tercius the Gracious. And I believe that this is the Christian theology. This is the fundamental difference between philosophy and theology. Theology does not deal with uh, abstract ideals, concepts, notions, uh, but theology deals with human being and God relationship. Second, the theology of that essence, the gracious, is what I call a cosmic theology. In other words, the whole universe, in all its aspects, dimensions, and manifestations, are part of his theological thinking. And indeed, this is very much orthodox theology. Everything that is related to theology, including the salvation, is very much cosmos-centered. 
and we see that in different ways, with different indices in the theological thinking of Nessus the Gracious. And third, the theology of Nessus the Gracious is theocentric theology. The beginning of the theology, according to his understanding, is God, not human. We see in the 20th century, particularly, some theologians who have perceived theology as human-centered. I think this is not the Christian understanding of theology. Nessus the Gracious repeatedly emphasizes that theology is the presence of God. Theology starts with the incarnation of the Son of God. Therefore, the whole theological, let's say, the talk, reflection, understanding must be perceived in terms of God-centered theology. The initiative belongs to God. God has revealed himself to humanity. Now I go to the ecclesiology of St. Nurses the Gracious. According to his ecclesiology, the church is essentially a community of faith, a community of people. Nurses repeatedly remind us that we must make a clear distinction between the institutional manifestations of the church and the church as being the living community, God-centered community. And I believe this is today the understanding of the church. This is at the center of the theology of Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant and Anglican churches. In 12th century, Nessus warns us by saying, you have to go beyond what appears in the church in terms of the building, the liturgy, the dogma, the hierarchy. Let's not confuse, he says, the manifestations of the church with the very being of the church, with the essential being of the church as the community, God-centered community. Second, According to their sister gracious, the church, any church, is Catholic, Orthodox, Apostolic, any church. And based on the biblical perception of the church, as Jesus said, if a few people come together in my name, I am there. There is the church. There is the Catholic, the Orthodox, the Apostolic Church. And today, the ecumenical movement, particularly, I believe, the Catholic and the Anglican and Orthodox churches are repeatedly reminding this perception of ecclesiology. Now I move to the third part of my presentation, namely the unity. The perception of unity of St. Nurses the Gracious. By the way, Nurses was invited by the patriarch, the Greek patriarch of the time, and the emperor, the Byzantine emperor, to come together and discuss together the church unity. 
The church unity at that time was, was important for the Byzantine Empire for different reasons. Therefore, this is the gracious engages in dialogue and correspondence with the Church of Greece. And in this correspondence, he clearly outlines his perception of Christian unity, as well as he exposes the theological and doctrinal position of the Armenian Church, particularly regarding the Christology. Let me just uh, spell out some of the significant aspects of this correspondence and dialogue, uh, particularly pertaining uh, to the concept of Christian unity. First, Nessus repeated and strongly emphasizes that the unity is a God-given reality. It is not a human achievement. It is of incarnational reality. Through the incarnation of Jesus Christ, we are invited to express that Therefore, unity is Christocentric and not an institutional centered unity. Second, I believe that nurses must be reminded in world Christian and particularly in ecumenism as a person who tried to take the church in terms of the church unity from consensus in formulations or in uh, definitions uh, to consensus in interpretation. This is very important and I want to repeat it. He tried to move the church's perception of unity as being consensus in formulations to the unity or consensus in interpretation. Let me give you an example as he has given that example in his correspondence with the Greek church. Some of you as theologians or students of theology should know that the Council of Chalcedon was the first cause of the division in world history. In the Council of Chalcedon, two formulations were discussed regarding the divinity and the humanity of Jesus Christ. There were two theological school of thinking. One nature in Jesus Christ, particularly uh, uh, hold firmly by the Alexandrian theological school, and uh, two natures in Jesus Christ, humanity and divinity. And these two different formulations uh, generated uh, a huge discussion, controversy, and even division within the church. This is the gracious says, if one nature, you understand the two natures united in Jesus Christ without confusion, without alteration, without change. And uh, if we by one nature understand the same, that means that in different ways, with different uh, formulations, uh, we are saying the same thing. Therefore, 
We have a consensus. Formulations divide us, but interpretations uh, bring us together. You mentioned rather theological dialogue between Oriental and Anglican Church. Between them, I would like also to go further than that. Between the Catholic Church and Orthodox Churches. Between Oriental and Eastern Orthodox Churches. In all these theological dialogues regarding the Christology, they came to say the same thing as St. Ersef the Gracious has said in 12th century. That, that's still the formulation in history. But today, you see, we have, have the same interpretation regarding these two different formulations that we have inherited from history. Three. Nessus firmly believes uh, that the Christian unity must be perceived as a unity in diversity. Because the churches are living in different environments. They are impacted by the particularities of that environment. Therefore, the churches must preserve in terms of their cultural, liturgical expressions. But the unit of faith, unity of faith based on the apostolic tradition must be the basis and the sustaining power of the Christian unity. Three, in writing to the Byzantine emperor and the ecumenical patriarch of the time, Nessus the Gracious said, with God's willing, if we come together and sit around the table to discuss Christian unity and achieve Christian unity, we have to talk to each other as equals. Because before God, there is no big church and small church. We are all Christians. We are all equals. And I believe today the ecumenical movement emphasizes the same thing. That whoever we are, whatever we are, big church or small church, we are the church. We are the people of God. So we have to sit together as equal Christians and churches before God. Five, as I referred to earlier, the perception of Nessus the Gracious regarding the unity is a Christocentric not ecclesiocentric. That means that in our discussion regarding the Christian unity, we have to base our discussions, our perceptions, our approaches on Jesus Christ. Because we may have different ecclesiological perceptions, but Jesus Christ unites us. He says the church in different ways as an institutional reality may divide us, but Jesus Christ brings us together, he unites us. And finally, the Catholic emphasizes the crucial importance of collaboration. Collaboration. Because he believes that the church unity is not an abstract reality. But that is the rapprochement between the churches, the collaboration. And today, uh, the ecumenical movement puts a special emphasis on relationship and collaboration among the churches. Now, I want to move to the last 
start of my presentation, namely the impact of his greatest man on the theological thinking of the Armenian Church. First, our theology has always been Bible-centered and Christology-oriented theology. If we look at the theological thinking of the Armenian Church throughout the centuries, you will clearly identify that the Bible, the interpretation, hermeneutics of the Bible, has always been at the heart of Armenian Church's theological thinking. But the Bible has never been in isolation but always in relationship with Christology, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Therefore, in our theology, we have tried to bring them together and see as one whole the Bible and Jesus Christ at the heart of Bible. Secondly, Mindedness, flexibility, openness have always been the driving force and the sustaining power of the theological thinking of the Armenian Church. And today you can see that very clearly in Armenian churches ecumenical relations uh, with other churches. We brought my We don't put any boundaries uh, in our relationship with other churches. I know that some churches put some restrictions, particularly regarding the Eucharistic celebration or the communion. According to our tradition, any person who wants to get communion from the Armenian Church, any person, he or she can do that. We don't say, are you Armenian? Are you Catholic? Are you Protestant? No. Such things doesn't exist, has never existed in the Armenian Church. Here is a, a concrete manifestation of the broad mind of the Armenian Church, which we have inherited from our forefathers and particularly from Nurses the Gracious. Three, as I said, the unity has always been for us, particularly after the Nurses the Gracious, the unity in diversity. But a reconciled diversity. I think we have to be extremely careful. Diversity is, if left alone, they may generate separation, division. But we need the kind of diversity that bring us together. This is what I call reconciled diversity. And this is today very much our church's perception of Christian unity. Four, today our churches are engaged in multi and bilateral dialogues. As I said, Catholic Church, Protestant churches, we are surrounded with many bilateral dialogues. And I'm quite aware of what's happening there. Personally, I have been uh, initiator of some of the dialogues and have played in the past as a bishop an active role in many dialogues. In my humble judgment, today 
we have exhausted almost in this dialogue all the con controversial, divisive, dogmatic issues on climatology, the Christology, etc. What we need today as part of these bilateral dialogues is socio-ethical issues. These issues today have become more divisive among the churches and even within a church than Christological or pneumatological issues. By the way, I have said to three popes, John Paul II, Benedictus, and Francis. The same thing. I said, today, who cares about the filial way? Who cares about the nature of Jesus Christ? Are they united and divided? This belongs to history. We may talk about this in the seminaries, in the textbooks, but today we are faced as churches with more divisive and deeply divisive issues, so-called socio-political, socio-ethical issues that are impacting our life, and they are present in different aspects of our life today in this globalized world. Therefore, we cannot, any church, including my own church, we cannot ignore the presence, the existentially, the presence of these issues. The churches must take these issues very seriously. And these issues, as I said, should become part of the bilateral and multilateral ecumenical and theological dialogues. Then, in conclusion, I think uh, we have to learn from our past. We need to identify those aspects, those challenges, of our church history and church fathers, which are relevant to the present day realities. Today, when we look at the Armenian church and at St. Mercy's the Gracious, we may identify a number of issues which are relevant today. Therefore, for my church, I think we must take these issues very seriously. In a broader ecumenical movement, I think some of these issues are very much relevant, particularly the church unity. You mentioned faith and forth. I have been part of Faith and Order, and I know that the Faith and Order uh, has discussed exhaustively all the issues, concerns, models related to Christian faith. But where we are, this is a challenge before us. The World Council of Churches has been in close dialogue through a joint working group with the with Vatican, with the Roman Catholic Church. We have engaged in dialogue with the Roman Catholic Church, with the Anglican Church, as we just mentioned. But today, I think I see some sort of uh, stagnation, a medical stagnation. We need to move forward. I think more than at any time, today, the church unity is a must. But how can we achieve that? I believe through collaboration, through dialogue. 
You also mentioned Father Henry Hill. I have known him. I have read his book, and even I have made a small quotation in one of my articles from his book. Today, the all the churches need to come together in different ways uh, by engaging uh, uh, in bilateral or multilateral dialogues. And our emphasis in ecumenical how we can together and always together face the multiple challenges that we are facing in the world today. I think this is the challenge that St. Nelson the Gracious put before us, not only before the Armenian Church, but I believe before the world of Christian Church. Thank you very much. The responsibility as the General Secretary is to lift up the call for gospel unity, to provide direction and leadership through the development of vision and priorities, to implement the strategic and program plans of the Council, to facilitate Canadian and global ecumenical, ecumenical relationships, and to participate and lead in Canadian interfaith initiatives. Peter has been with the Council since 1999, beginning as Associate Secretary for Justice and Peace. Active in his home church, the Christian Reformed Church in North America, he was ordained as a commissioned pastor in November 2019. Thank you so much for the opportunity to say a few words and to bring greetings from the members of the Canadian Council of Churches. We have 26 member churches of the Anglican Lutheran tradition, and the Evangelical and Pre-Church tradition, the Eastern and Oriental Orthodox traditions, Eastern and Roman Catholic traditions, and Historic Protestant traditions. And we're pleased to bring greetings on behalf of our member churches here in Canada. Um, we say in the Canadian Council of Churches that we respond to Christ's call for unity and peace, that we seek Christ's truth with an affection for diversity. And we act in love through prayer, dialogue, and witness to the gospel. Those sound like the themes that you just spoke about. Especially I'm thinking about seeking Christ's truth with an affection for diversity. So there are so many things that could be said, but just maybe to kick off a, a question uh, that comes to mind for me, both at the global level the World Council of Churches, where you provide such leadership, but also here in the Canadian Council of Churches, it's one that I experience. Let me try to be brief in laying this, in laying out my question. It's really about justice. So, leading up to Karlsruhe and the Assembly, we spoke and collaborated and acted together on a pilgrimage for justice and peace. The theme in Karlsruhe was Christ's love moves the world to reconciliation and unity. And now going forward, we're talking about a pilgrimage or a journey of, of justice, unity, and reconciliation. Justice found its way back to there. 
And I'm aware in Canada that often I experience the, well, if we want justice, we might have to sacrifice a little bit of unity. Or if we want to preserve unity, we might have to give up on some of our justice commitments. What's your experience and what might Saint His Grace, Saint Ignatius say about the underlying connection between unity and justice? Well, uh, first of all, these issues, unity, justice, reconciliation, peace, pilgrimage, these issues have been discussed in the World Council, particularly uh, in, uh, by Canadian order in different ways, uh, but always uh, in that togetherness. I think separating these issues may lead us to different directions uh, and to other uncertainties. Uh, we have made a special effort, particularly to discuss justice and unity together. But I do believe that we have been able to see to uh, challenge the churches to take part in these uh, discussion and pilgrimage, as you mentioned. I think the whole concept of a spiritual journey, pilgrimage, is uh, at the heart of being Christian. What does it mean being Christian or being a church? We are not settled here in this world. We are, we should perceive ourselves in a situation of restlessness. We are restless. Huh? That hope, you see, make us restless. We look forward. Therefore, this uh, uh, concept of pilgrimage, as it should remain at the heart of our reflection and action in the ecumenical movement. And that is why I think all the churches, not only the member churches of the World Council, but including the Roman Catholic Church, all the churches uh, should be part of this uh, growing uh, uh, process of pilgrimage. The other thing is, uh, I think uh, peace and justice must be taken again in their uh, close interconnectedness. There were times in the ecumenical movement uh, when we put the emphasis on peace. But there is no peace without justice. Both peace and justice are not human made. They are God-given realities. This is our understanding of peace and justice. Therefore, how we can take these two dimensions in their togetherness and through people-oriented action programs and initiatives not only discuss these issues, but engage ourselves in, this, in a kind of actions that will really generate peace with justice. It's wonderful to be in your presence again. I am the prevention to Ken and Alex and Martin Cowan. And I've met you several times at the World Council of Churches. It's a delight to see you again. And thank you for your lecture. I resonated with so much of what you accounted about. And there's is the gracious, and I want to go home and read all about it because he sounds like a forerunner of all that we are doing in the ecumenical movement. Uh, I wanted to refer to your question about moving on from theological, specifically Christological dialogue, uh, to engagement with the social, political, economic realities of our time. Uh, that, you're probably aware, is what has been happening in the Anglican Orthodox dialogue, uh, where having laid out in a wonderful way in the, in the Church of the Triune God, the report of the um, Cyprus uh, meeting of the Anglican Orthodox dialogue, setting out our agreement about the Church, we then moved on to discuss anthropology, and said that if we could agree about the nature of humanity, then we might be able to say something together about those pressing questions which are afflicting humanity at the time. 
And so that dialogue is also allowing them to speak uh, together about creation and about the beginning and ending of life ethical questions. I think it's a good model for our continuing dialogue on those things that really uh, resonate in the human heart these days. But I have a specific question, and that is about the Christology agreement. Uh, what is their status in the Oriental Orthodox world? Have they been received? Because if so, uh, we can delight in the fact that all of our churches have agreed about the nature of Christ and uh, say that that one at least is settled. Thank you. Well, concerning the anthropology, I think there was uh, sometimes in the World Council of Churches in the early 70s uh, where anthropology was given high priority. Anthropology. And the name of this special program was Humanities Studies. Uh, and as far as I remember, there was an Anglican uh, theologian leading this program. But unfortunately, uh, this program was marginalized. In one of my moderator's report to the Central Committee, I emphasized uh, the vital importance of giving uh, high priority to anthropology because most of the things that we have been discussing in the World Council or in the ecumenical movement are in one way or another related to anthropology. Who is human being? Uh, second, concerning Christology. Look, uh, in all theological dialogues of Christology, Oriental and Eastern, Oriental and Catholic, Eastern Orthodox and Catholic, Anglican and Orthodox. In all these uh, different bilateral theological dialogues, uh, we have reached a clear consensus. Almost the same with no real difference. That, as I said earlier, you see, first, first, that we have, we should not uh, take into consideration the acceptance of the Council of Calcium. That's part of history. For some churches, you see, the, the first three ecumenical councils constitute the basis of their theology. For others, the first seven ecumenical councils. For the Catholic Church, all the councils in 20, uh, 21 or 22 councils since the Vatican II. So, we leave this to history, but we should come to an agreement concerning, in this case, the Christological teachings of the Council of Calcium and the way we understand it. And in this regard, we have reached a consensus. First. Second, we have reached a second uh, understanding regarding uh, the heresies, the anathemas against certain heretical persons or persons who have been accepted by certain churches as saints, but who have been anathematized by other churches. We said that lifting of anathemas is a must, but lifting of anathemas doesn't mean the acceptance of the other as saints. So there was also an agreement on this matter. There was also another question regarding uh, the hiring or the protocol. The protocol. In the Eastern Orthodox churches, there is a, a, a protocol, you see, uh, coming from history, the ecumenical backyard, and the, the four major patriarchates, and the local churches. Well, the Oriental Orthodox churches doesn't have such protocol. So when we come together, what will happen? 
In my, in one of my books, like on conciliar fellowship, you see, regarding this issue, I propose that taking into certain consideration and historical realities, we have to consider his holiness the Pope as the presiding bishop of this unity of the heads of the churches. This is my personal, this is my personal view. Now, we have discussed all these things, and in fact, you see, these bilateral dialogues have become, in a sense, repetitive. There, was, there is nothing to be added to this. The findings of these dialogues uh, were sent to the heads of the church and the synods. We are still expecting the reactions of the churches. So, uh, on the basis of this reaction, I believe that we have to take a, a concrete step forward. This is where we are. But as you know, there are certain internal problems in some of the Orthodox churches. Uh, therefore, probably this is not the time to see uh, to take that collective action. But we have to work along these lines by reminding the churches that we have to be very serious about this Christological consensus because that has been and still that is a major you see, uh, factor that has created division among the churches. Specifically, when it comes to the question of lifting of the anathemas that you just alluded to, with respect to someone like the figure of Severus of Antioch, who is venerated as a saint, the church father in the Coptic and Syriac Orthodox churches, to which I belong, and uh, is considered uh, well, on the list of heretics in the Armenian Apostolic Church. So, how does that work uh, while we are trying to look? to our brothers and sisters from the other churches while lifting an atoms from other figures while within our own community. It doesn't seem like we have achieved that yet. Well, uh, you're right. Uh, even you see the Syrian and the Armenian church, the Coptic church belongs, you see, to the Oriental Orthodox family. Uh, there are certain, um, let's say, uh, difficulties or misunderstandings uh, that needs to be settled down with, among these churches. Or for instance, you see the whole question of corruptibility uh, regarding, you see, the, the, the Christology, you see. And also, there are certain different uh, positions regarding some of the few persons. So, we know this, and we, we have to discuss these matters uh, among the Oriental Orthodox churches. In, in fact, in one of my books, in a footnote, I have mentioned this, and I have proposed that these matters uh, need to be taken very seriously by the Oriental Orthodox. hope-filled lecture in such a divisive world today, especially here in the West. Uh, my question is, regarding divisiveness and what you mentioned in your lecture, how can the Church engage in inclusion and engage with its communities in spite of the increased secularism that exists in the world, especially here in the West? Well, uh, in theology, I think uh, we have to make a clear distinction between secularism and 
secularization. Because these two terms have different connotations. We're part of secularization. That is to say, the church is in the reality in the society. You cannot draw a line of demarcation between the society and the church. We're part of the society. But we have a different vision. We cannot identify the church to see fully with the society. But the church is there as an integral part of society with different character, identity, and vision. But secularism. Secularism is, uh, is the denial of the, the spiritual values, ethical values. Uh, the society, the godless society. It's a human centered society. And that is why, you see, there are certain things that today we see, certain trends, certain practices. Certain uh, uh, perspectives uh, coming from secularism, uh, which are not acceptable uh, for the church and even for some other religions. So secularism uh, often generates certain uh, trends uh, that may question the credibility, the relevance the identity and the mission of the church. And therefore, as I said earlier, you see, all these so-called socio-ethical issues, these issues are coming from a secularized society, from secularized society, and the church cannot ignore these issues which are affecting our societies, even our people. This is why, you see, I propose that these issues be part of the agenda of bilateral or multilateral theological and ecumenical discussion among the churches. You mentioned that uh, currently socio-ethical issues are a primary matter in the field of ecumenism. I was wondering, what are some of the most pressing socio-ethical issues you feel the church is facing today? And how do you feel the church could respond to that? You see, if you prepare the list of these issues, I think it's going to be a long list. A long list. But in dealing with these issues, the church has to put some priorities, some priorities, okay? And the churches may have different views. If you pose that question to the representative of the churches in terms of which of these socio-ethical issues in your view would be a priority for you, you may get different answers, different answers. Uh, therefore, in, in selecting, in identifying these issues, uh, the church should be very serious. I mean, we cannot just you see, say, this, we are with this, we are against this. We have to sit down as churches and look at these issues and the way they affect our people. I tell you something, which I propose to our bishops in the United States of America and Canada to come together in New York to see on the occasion of my next pontifical visit to our Eastern Diocese, to sit down and discuss these issues at least to prepare the least, the least, the most critical, crucial issues. Uh, and we have to present this, this list and try how we can respond to these issues. As I said, we should not be always uh, reactive. I said respond. Not reactive, not rejecting. This issue 
issues are part of our life, whether we like it or not. We have to be proactive. We have to look at these issues from the perspective of the Bible, the teachings of our church, of our theology, okay? And then look at the reality. So I would approach it with you both to see biblical, theological, and also realistic. How we can reconcile these two perspectives it's not easy. It's not easy. We cannot do that just on the paper. Uh, we have to be very realistic in dealing with these uh, critical issues. I'm born and raised in Beirut and lived among the Christians who belong to different churches. Um, we all uh, uh, were friends and never thought we were different. When I moved to Canada, I was asked by many, many people, are you Catholic or Christian? <laughs> could you explain this? <laughs> because I, could, I was speechless and I couldn't answer right away. I had to think about my answer. Uh, that's my first question. And the second one is, uh, how do you define the unity of the church? Well, if uh, somebody poses that question, I think we have to say we are all Christians. We have a common law, Jesus Christ. Uh, we have one God. We may have different perceptions of God, of Jesus Christ, of the nature of Jesus Christ, but uh, we are one in Christ. The other day, you see, I mentioned this somewhere, I think, uh, there is a song, it's a like a protestant song that we used to sing in ecumenical gatherings. We are one in Christ. That is the basis of our existence. Well, regarding the unit of the church, in ecumenical movements, we have discussed a number of models of Christian unity. The basic model that I think uh, uh, very close to all the churches, I would say, is the visible unity of the church. And in fact, this is the goal of ecumenical movements, you see, to express, to realize the visible unity of the church. The unity should not be a conceptual reality. It, it has to be expressed in the life of our churches, the liturgical, theological, life and the mission, and in fact the daily life of our people. But we again we have different uh, perceptions of the visible unit. The Catholic Church has its own perceptions, the Oriental with the Orthodox churches, the mainstream Protestant churches. Uh, but everybody believes that the unity is a must. It's a imperative for our being Christian in the world today. For your presentation, I heard about St. Nurses last month in Atelier. Now I hear another perspective or dimension about St. Nurses and his perspective on unity. Uh, what I was thinking reflecting during the lecture that the World Council of Churches is focused on dogmatic <coughs> issues that separating the churches. And we know that uh, in the early church history, all the churches tried to come together to define uh, Christological issues or ecclesiastical issues so they can face the heresies uh, in, in that area. So it was something, a, a stage in history that the dogma was the main issue of the church. And now, as you said, as you mentioned in your lecture, we see that it's exhausting. We are, we are uh, organizing dialogues, 
on dogmatic issues and still we are not on that achievement that we are dreaming of. Why the World Council of Churches cannot focus on the sufferings that all churches are experiencing? Because we know from the Gospel, the passion of Christ calls us, invites us to the resurrection, to the unity of the church. And uh, as you mentioned, socio-ethical issues where we find the sufferings that we experience as a church, as a whole, it's, it's more an issue that can unite us than the dogmatic issues. I would love to hear about this from you. If you look at the history of the church in general, you will clearly see that the ecumenical councils were held as a reaction to the emerging heresies and heretical movements. The ecumenical council is not a necessity. It became a necessity because of heretical rules. If you look at the ecumenical council, you will see that each of these councils you see, were held you know, vis a vis or as a reaction to heretical movements. Today, we are invaded by so many visible and invisible heresies uh, that are destroying the credibility and the relevance of our Christian faith. In fact, I have made the same thing in the same proposal to the three the popes. I proposed that the convention of the Third Vatican Council has become a necessity. This time to deal with new kind of heresy <coughs> that surrounds us. All of us. And I said, if the Catholic Church can be the Vatican Third meeting, then I believe that all the churches will welcome and in a sense take part in this council, considering it as their own council. Because in one way or another, on a larger or smaller scale, we are confronted with this kind of new heresies in all parts of the world. 